All right, Kyle Long is here, CBS Sports star, Greenlight Podcast with his brother Chris, who was on the show a couple weeks ago, one of our favorites. First time we've ever created content together. What's going on, brother? Yeah, I'm just chilling, man. I'm so happy we get to do this. Uh, we spoke about it last week via Twitter or X or whatever the hell we're going to call it. And I've been stoked about it. I, I even like, I told Kate, I was like, you have to remind me at 1240 that we have to stop playing Fortnite because the baby goes down and <laughs> baby goes down at noon. As you know, the schedule thing is important. Uh, yeah, of course. And we, we run like a Coach Coughlin ship here where yeah. it's, you know, five minutes early is on time. So we got that baby down, or she got it down 11. She got her down at 11.55. We played Fortnite, and I was like, the vibes are good, but I got to get out of here. The vibes are going to be better on this pod. How much gaming do you do on a daily basis? That's that's it. I mean, <laughs> it's, been, it's been my anchor for a very yeah. long time. No, of course. Uh I got, you know, when I went down to Florida State when I was 19, yeah. I just had so much damn fun. And I found that my free time would be better spent doing something a little less destructive. And while some yes. would argue that it is destructive, I've met some of my longest lasting friends through gaming and uh, guys that were in my wedding, stuff like that. So it's important to me to, to find new challenges. And I'm enamored with technology and the engines that are running these games and the developers that spend so much time, it's fascinating to me. So when I'm playing the game, I'm not just sitting there drooling down my sweatshirt, which sometimes I do, but uh, a lot of it is just having an appreciation for it. Like when people go to the movies and they're like, yeah. well, how do they make this? You know, that's yeah. the same feeling I have, uh, you know, playing video games. And the same thing could be watching movies because I was watching Mario earlier mm. and I was like, this is this guy's brain. Yeah in this universe i mean when they're they're riding down rainbow road and peach asks mario she's like uh do you guys do this where you're from he's like no nah, we don't drive on rainbows <laughs> that's somebody's brain uh and yeah. that's what i like about gaming i i've said this to friends in the past my life would probably be dramatically worse if i was good at video games because i love fifa and i love madden and i love ncaa football when they made it and they, they'll make it again but like what the the guard against me becoming addicted to video games is I'll play for FIFA for like five hours. I have nothing to do. Right. But then I'll yeah. go play online and I'll just get rocked like seven nil by some like 11 year old from Chile who's playing with Juventus. And I'm like, oh, I suck at this. I'm never going to be good. Time to go do obligations. Time to go. Live, I always live try to life. find new games for that very reason. And there's so many games. I use the PC. So like Steam is sure. the apparatus in which you can acquire and download games and my steam library is so huge not because like i want to flex how many games i have yeah. it's because i suck at so many games i have to continue to be imperial about my downloads because we got to find the thing that i that's meant for me right uh right. and to your point you can only play fifa so long and get your ass whooped so long before it's like let me just go outside May I suggest golf if you want to just try new frontiers to get your ass kicked? Um, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, what's going on in football right now. I want to start, okay. I want to start here. Um, the Eagles' tailspin. I don't think I've seen anything like it. There were people who said, "Okay, the 2020 Steelers was like this. Uh, 2019 Patriots was a little bit like this." I I don't know. Like the talent level on this team was such that even if you thought they were fraudulent in the first half of the season, they, they did make the Super Bowl last year. They could have won the Super Bowl. Um, across the lines, they were they were really good. They had talent everywhere. They had a good roster. I'm curious, if you've ever been in this situation, could you describe what it feels like for a team to be in a tailspin and for us to be like, oh, my God, we have no solutions here? Like, what? how do you process that as a player, Kyle? Well, it's a great point. And to your, to your point, I've never been on a team like that because I don't think, quite frankly, it's ever happened. And a team that was, what were they, 10-1 and one going into Kansas City? Um, and I picked them to be undefeated going into the <laughs> Kansas City game at the beginning of the year. Yeah. I said that, and people laughed at me. And I was like, look, they're not the most dominant team in the, in the league, but do they have guys that are alphas that can win at certain positions that are important at the game of football, like A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Jalen Hurts? Not to mention the guy who's retired last yeah. night, Jason Kelsey. You've got the ultimate advantage when it comes to short yardage situations. Um, add that to the fact that you've got a guy who can pierce uh, the armor of the defense with Lane Johnson front side, or he can make sure to cover up that backside double team in the zone game. They have the pieces to be dominant. I don't understand how you can't sustain that. And obviously the holes proved to be too much on defense. But when you're on a, a roster like that, um, they say don't listen to the noise. Right. 
Um, and we were talking about Flight Simulator before the uh, before the show yeah. started, and uh, I was watching these videos the other day because I'm into the whole learning how to fly thing. And these instructors, they put the students into a tailspin. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you pay attention to the audio, which they have, and the video, the passenger who is the pilot, who is a a young pilot trying to uh, achieve his certification. And then there's the OG pilot who puts him in a tailspin. And he's like, because I know how to get him out of this. To me, uh, Nick Sirianni was the, the passenger in that situation, didn't understand how to get himself out of a tailspin. And I look back to some of the cocky things that he was yeah. doing early in the season. You go to Kansas City, you get a win. And man, oh, man, his, his, his words spoke louder than his actions, I would say, in that game. We all knew that that game – um, was tight, but Nick Sirianni was pretty loose. Uh, and I think his players saw it. Jalen Hurts, uh, one of your leaders, if not your leader, outside of Jason Kelsey, is kind of telling you to tone it down. Um, I think th- that's where it, that's where the house of cards starts to fall. And then you start to fulfill this prophecy that the outside world yeah. has, um, you know, they're delivering trash cans to your, to your <laughs> facility and uh, they're saying terrible things about not just one guy. I mean, yeah. it's everybody. It's guys who you and I have a ton of respect for in this league. Darius Slay had a trash can named after him outside of the Philadelphia facility. Now, we've all been there, you know what I mean, like sure. as players. But for Philadelphia, for whatever reason, it compounded over and over again. And by the end of this thing, we were looking at a team that we didn't even recognize. I completely agree. I'm curious with the Sirianni thing because I got into it with someone in the league who really likes Sirianni. And I, I – I was not a huge fan. Um, I just felt like some of his actions suggested, like the Eagles are always going to be good because they have a good infrastructure and a good roster and they have a good quarterback and they're strong on the line. So they understand how to win football games. It felt to me like Sirianni um, was maybe born on third base a little bit as far as taking that coaching job when he did. Now he did good things the first two years, obviously, but um, his demeanor to me rubbed me the wrong way. And somebody, the person I was going at it with was like, well, it's because he's not doing the things we associate with being a coach. He's not stoic. He's a new age coach. He's different. I, not to quote Tony Soprano, would have wrapped into the strong silent type. Like, I do think there's value in kind of the Belichick, the Belichick staring straight ahead leader of men thing. Can you speak on what kind of coach you like? And it can be the fun lead. And I'm so with you. And that's a dynamite reference. Um, When I got to, when I got to the league, I had Mark Tressman. And he was as cerebral a coach I've ever, as I've ever been around. And we had answers to everything. He paired his wisdom with a tremendous hire at offensive line coach, Aaron Cromer. He had the assistant O-line coach, Pat Meyer, who at the time was as brilliant as I've seen in blitz pickup. Yep. Um, so you coupled the blitz pickup with the Mark Tressman thing. Uh, but our, our hump that we had to get over was B Marsh and Jay Cutler and obviously the holes on our defense. Uh, but he wasn't a leader of men in terms of getting in front of the offense right. and the defense at the same time and saying, Lance, shut up, stop laughing at me, right. you know, like, or, or cracking a joke back at Charles Tillman, yeah. who was one of the funniest, <laughs> funniest guys I've ever been around and best football players and teammates. But some guys aren't built to rein those dudes in. Some dudes can't command that room. And when I got to Kansas City, when Andy Reid got up and spoke, and, you know, he didn't speak much. Uh, he didn't have to speak yeah. much. But when he did, people listened. And to your point, whatever happened to the strong, silent type? And while Andy's jovial and getting his guys cheeseburgers, and how about those cheese? Yeah. He's not Bill Belichick no. in that regard. Um, he's still the strong, silent type. And you don't want a bad representation of your team coming from your head coach. To me, Andy Reid has said this before, and I think about it a lot. You don't have to do much to be a leader. He has said that if if you can't fit everything you want to convey in a meeting on a on a one card, one cue card, it it's not worth saying. And I think that I never I never heard him say that, but that's you know it's very precise as to the rules at which he follows. Yeah, and like players are not going to sit there for ninety minutes and just listen to you just drone on and on. Your brother was on the show a couple weeks ago and talked about how there was one coach, he a head coach he, that he liked that would have meetings so long that guys would sneak out back and get treatment and then come back because the lights would be off. And it's like sometimes guys just tune you out and, and all that stuff. I need to ask you, can you define what a coach losing a locker room? looks like because i like to ask guys and sometimes they have different questions and whatever but like 
if you've if it, it doesn't matter if it's a head coach or position coach or a coordinator or whatever when 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 a group stops listening to a guy it it, it shows up where well, I want to preface this with saying that there's no locker room, that there's no coach, that there's no player that is immune to maybe talking behind a coach's right. back. Um, like any workplace, like any workplace, your boss. I mean, we see, we saw it go public about Andy Reid with yeah. LaShawn McCoy, albeit none of it's true. And that's just, you know, wild. And I think LaShawn maybe achieved what he was trying to achieve there, but uh Every locker room has that to a certain extent, but when you lose a locker room, is to your point when you're not listening, when you lose the guys in the meetings, when you lose the guys um, on when your buzzwords aren't buzzing anymore, um, you know they don't have me on the edge of my seat. That's when you lose a locker room, and I, I've I've been in situations where the coach isn't completely to blame for the situations, but. Uh, there are factions within the team that lose that. And obviously you just lose that unity in the locker room. There's division. There's some people that are, that are his guy maybe. Um, and they're going to stick it out, tough it out. And they're not, it's a never say die emotionally. They're not going to check out. And then there's some dudes that check out way yeah. early. And the more dudes you have that are checked out and they believe in the, pro in the, the self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, you know, that's, to me how it goes it's like the other night when matt lafleur was like we want the ball yeah to start the game we won the kickoff we don't want it in the second half we want it right now because i know who you are and i think you know who you are dallas Ooh. and when they got the ball and they scored it became a track meet it was like <laughs> it happened again you could see mccarthy's face yeah. right like yeah. McCarthy's face, C.D. Lamb, Aaron Andrews glowing report about the 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 guy C.D. Lamb that she was so enamored with before the game is now like, oh my gosh, there's turmoil on the sideline. My report has gone sour, and I love EA, great reporting, but that's the that's a microcosm of that situation we're talking about, where people, even if you're in the playoffs, hosting a playoff game, or you're the Eagles and you're on the road and you had a skid, people start to not believe. Yeah, I that's a it's a wonderful point. Um, you were around the Chiefs, as you said, you were on the team, um, around Mahomes. Big game Mahomes, the demeanor in the locker room, the demeanor in the week, does it change? Is there like I feel like it's funny because I think sometimes we associate like, you know, the Michael Jordan or the Mamba mentality, or whatever. He comes from baseball where I think, and I've talked to him about this, it's a little more laid back. It's a little more like, all right, we're just going to um, take everything as it comes. He's just very even keel in that regard. Um, even his warm-up stuff comes from baseball, um, the long toss stuff he does. He really likes to keep it even keel. But does it change in January, early February? Uh, the thing I love and respect most about Patrick is that he is so consistent. Right. And uh, when you first show up, if you've never been around him, if you've never been around Travis, you've never been around Tyreek at the time, was there if you've never been around those guys you show up and you're like they can't keep this up every day right like they can't keep this they can't keep themselves up every day right uh, it can't happen the whole season and then week one happens and you're like holy shit. week two happens now you're week 10 week 11 they're doing the same thing next thing you know you're in the playoffs right. and patrick's still there early he's still playing basketball with the guys in his underwear and his socks in the locker room before practice so he's tight in the morning you know, he's in there, he's regimented, but then he's the baseball guy right. before practice. And then you go out to the blitz pickup and he wants to murder your defense. <laughs> and then in the stretch, you know, the stretch line, he's, he's, he's getting ready, but he's also with Travis or right. Chris Jones or whoever it is. And that's a, that's a testament to that locker room, but it's also a testament to his mental makeup, his professionalism, um, and his, his understanding of how important the moment is. And, my dad always said, there's a time to work, there's a time to play. And I think there's never been an example in my career that was better at understanding that difference mm. than Patrick and keeping things fresh throughout the season by dancing that line between go time and let's have a little showtime fun with it. That's fascinating. Um, I've heard, I've never, I guess I have seen it in, in training camp, but never, never like behind closed doors on like November 3rd him testing his limits, Patrick testing his limits in practice and just saying, what can I do here? What can I do here? Now, those stories have become less special as he does this stuff on the field. Like, you know, three years ago, I was like, whoa, wait till you see this guy. And then even when he was playing, like, we well, still got stuff in his arsenal. We've seen most of it now, but give me the most impressive thing you saw from Patrick Mahomes in a practice. It's 
so hard to put my finger. It's, I mean, that's that's really tough. Uh, and I don't think I'll be able to answer that's that. Okay. But I will. I will say that there were thirty days where I couldn't wait to get out of the meeting to call my dad because the post practice yeah. meeting to be like you're and I, I couldn't like show him film and stuff i didn't want to like film yeah, my yeah, ipad and send it to him which i know a lot of people do which i hate that's another yeah. conversation we need to have practice squad guys posting instagram stories of them breaking off some guy in practice but i digress and, you, like, you I could would do that out, next because i have some thoughts on that but go ahead i would get out of i would get out of practice and i'd either call my wife or i'd call my dad or i'd call chris I'd just laugh and he'd be like, what? And I'd be like, you know, I just, I've seen, so, it was like I worked at Area 51 and I couldn't quite talk about it. Um, whether it was trick plays we were working on or whether it was his communications with Andy, I think his understanding for for that Andy's the head honcho and he, he keeps that in the forefront. Um, at the time, it was Eric Bieniemy and Patrick Mahomes, which was... Uh, you know, it was musty TV, whether it was a practice in the moment, the intensity, if there was something that Andy installed, something that EB agreed with, and then that's something that Patrick ran and he didn't agree with it in totality, there was going to be a conversation that happened. And for, for the three, four seconds that there was a decision to be made, the intensity in that building is, uh, is awesome. And, and that's what makes them great because they challenge each other. Um, and I haven't even mentioned the throws, yes, uh, please, the throws, the ability to scramble, the understanding of who is where on his offensive line and how he's able to use yeah. that to his advantage. It was almost like a uh, Brazilian jujitsu artist where they use their opponent's strengths against yeah. them. Well, you're going to beat this guy here. I have the answer to that equation. And when I do, Big 87 is going to be on the same page with me. Or Jarek McKinnon's going to have his eyes snapped around. Um, and just making the entire locker room feel a part of something special. Because as you and I know, we could only dream of being in a locker room with Michael Jordan. Yeah. Or being uh, in the clubhouse with, you name it, the best baseball players. Or Shohei. And then Tiger Woods. Well, in football albeit I didn't get to play in any football right. games with him. Patrick Mahomes was that for me. And I think I'm not the only one who has that feeling and they get to share that locker with, room with him. And he's a man to them. Um, and then he puts his helmet on and he becomes something else. Not to stay on this for too long, but obviously, you know, the, the read offense, you mentioned it earlier. Give me something we don't appreciate enough about Andy Reid's offense and just the, the the way he makes life easy. It was funny because last week uh, Peyton was on the this, this show and I said, how does Kyle make Brock Purdy's life easier? And I got a couple of emails, which I very rarely get emails. You always get tweets and DMs. I got emails from these idiots who were like, you're trying to shade Brock. You're saying that Kyle Shannon makes life easy. I'm like, no, he, but he's uh, like, I'm makes not going to apologize <laughs> for complimenting <laughs> the coach. Both of these. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Like, yes. can I compliment Jordan Love and also say, and by God, do not forget that Matt Lafleur <laughs> is like running his offense. Yeah, exactly. And people are like, F- yeah. you man, don't don't you dare say his life is easy. Okay, but uh, getting back on track, yep, uh, Andy yep. Reid and Patrick Mahomes. I mean, it almost seems like written in the stars, written in football destiny, right? But if 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 you're uh, talking to somebody saying, "Help me appreciate something I've never thought about with Andy Reid's offense," it's what. Andy Reid gives the keys to the vehicle to Andy Heck, um, who is as underappreciated a staff member in the NFL as there is. And if he didn't have the seat that he currently has, he I think he's a guy that could be a head coach. Um, but it's not, it's not a sexy hire, and I'm an alignment. But the thing that I appreciate the most and that stood out to me the most about Andy Reid and his offense is that Andy Heck runs the run install. Yep. You know, when the offense defense split up different rooms, run install first, Andy Heck, you're up. Boom. And Andy goes up there and he does his thing. And, and he's as impressive as an install. It's like a military. I feel like we're going to invade somewhere to take something that they have that's ours when Andy Heck gets up there. Mm. And then Andy Reid gets up there and he does the screens. The screens are Andy's baby. And if you watch the way 
that this offense has a feel for screens. It looks like a really good basketball offense. You know, like they mm-hmm. just understand pass, 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 yeah. pass, pass. Oh, open shot. Let's take it. Well, they understand spacing um, better than anybody. And it's because Andy Reid has an appreciation for the big guys. And he knows better than anybody how this thing works. And his creative mind, being able to get certain guys in space, I've never seen it done like that. And to couple that with the offensive line install, mm-hmm. and Andy Heck and him are kind of in lockstep there. Uh, it's the Andy and Andy show that's really impressive to me. Um I take it you think Mahomes and Andy can win a Super Bowl with, with this receiving core? Uh, yeah, 100%. I think, I think Patrick's so damn good he can throw it up to himself and catch figure it. it out. Uh, you figure it out. You figure it out somewhere down the field. You know what? We looked at the way this offense looked the other night, and Travis had three drops. Yeah. And they were still rolling, and the ball was a brick. I know. The ball was a brick, okay? Like, that's – do not let that go – uh, without notice. I mean, the it's it's cold out. It hurts to get hit, but the ball is exponentially harder to catch and throw. So I look at those plays, and that's missed opportunities. That could have been every bit of blowout as we saw in, in Houston. Why should you bet with Caesar Sportsbook? Two words: Caesar's Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesar's can offer: hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app; it's an empire. There's a game coming up. This weekend, Baker Mayfield against Jared Goff. And there's been some weird revisionist history on Jared Goff. He was discarded by the Rams. The Rams did not want him. They didn't even, like, there were rumblings that, like, he would have been in a competition with, like, whoever the Rams brought in the next year. They did not want him anymore. Um, But both of those guys have had incredible recoveries due to coordinators who believe in them, franchises who surrounded them with talent, kept them upright in a lot of cases, um, and just let them be great. Now, obviously, they had a lot of talent, the first overall picks. Does this does that kind of thing serve to you as a good reminder on what how to give guys second chances or third chances in some cases in the league that, that tends not to give them? I think it serves as a reminder to players, particularly guys going through situations like that at lesser in lesser known battles yeah. than the Baker Mayfields and the Jared Goffs, that hey, if you just keep your if you can keep your tank running. If you can keep your gun shooting and you can keep your tracks relatively uninjured uh, and stick around, whether it be a couple months or a couple years, you will get another crack at this thing. Don't burn bridges mm. um, and have faith. Uh, I think that's really important because, you know, this thing can be taken from you in a minute. But if you keep that positive mindset like Baker Mayfield, every time we see him on camera, he's smiling, yep. he's infectious, and he understands that. He, he had to tough it out and now he's in the uh he's in that hidden valley that fertile crescent now of his career and dave canales what was he coaching high school yeah. they were saying like, like Couple, was that was the last school. that was the last time he was uh play college like was baker mayfield was living in the stadium this guy was coaching high schoolers um in carson california at the home depot center, home depot center. there's a lot going on there and also todd bowles uh yeah. that defense you know what do they say? Uh, out, out, outgunned, but not outmanned. Yep. I would say uh, that that's how that Bucks unit has operated. And Tom Bowles, he's going to bring it, but I think the X factor is going to come down to protection. And I think Detroit's got too much. I think that they're bringing more men than the Bucks have. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch. And Jared Goff is good for him, man. Keep kicking ass, Jared Goff. He's fun to watch. I hate the Lions. People think that I'm supposed to hate the Packers. I appreciate and respect the Lions. I hate the Lions. I hated playing them. They're a physical group. Uh, they are uh, in lockstep with what the city's all about. They're a tough blue-collar group, but as a Chicago Bear, oh, I hate to see it. And the Packers are doing good, too. We call that a segue in our industry because we're going to talk about the Bears here. Um, okay. I know it's painful. All right, so let's say tomorrow Kevin Warren says, I'm deputizing you as my assistant president. You have free reign over everything. What's what are your first few moves to fix the 2024 Bears? And that I don't not just talking about roster. There's not talking about coaching staff. I'm talking about everything. Total franchise overhaul. Or if you wanted to, where are you going with it? If I didn't know that um, Greg Roman was just interviewed, 
I mean, it like it. I, I, so like, is this post ex? This is right now. This is right now. This is right. Okay. Tuesday, well, I January see, I 16th. see that we have brought Greg Roman in, and I think that if you've got Justin Fields, it's obviously the smart decision. Um, we may be. We've seen the ceiling in terms of throwing the football with Justin Fields, and it is tantalizing at times. There's there's no throw he can't make on the football field, but it's the consistency that's in question. One way to make a talent more consistent is look at a more blue-chip stock. You know what I mean? Something that's not as um, high return. It's going to be lower return, but we can get it consistently, and that's the run game. Mm-hmm. And uh, Greg Roman, uh, better than anybody, is able to use – the weapons that the bears currently have. I think you can use Cole Komet to an extreme advantage in that offense in particular. People have wanted more out of Cole Komet. And I think that's the answer there and better than Baltimore. We've got DJ Moore, And I think that we can add a couple pieces in the draft here. Obviously the number one pick, uh, if it's not Greg, if it's not Greg Roman in the building calling the plays, I'm going to go for Caleb Williams. Right. Um, but let's, Stick with the Greg Roman theme. Justin Fields is in the building. That's our coach, Matt Eberflus. Okay, we got the OC now. You trade the first pick. Um, I don't even know what you would get for that. And then you got to go get the best receiving option. Mm -hmm. So you can have two different archetypes at receiver out there. And I'd say go go with what the uh, go with what the Ravens have done. You can mix in some of what the Rams have done with eleven personnel. This year, I think that there's not a better offense at running 11 personnel than the Rams. I know it's two completely different um, sides of the uh, the country here, but if you do have to throw it, take some of Sean McVay's concepts. Mm. For everything else, Greg Roman, here's the headset. Have at it. Have Justin Fields run the offense you want. But my concern is obviously the health of Justin Fields sure. moving forward. If this is the play that we're going to make, um, I think the high IQ – play is go after the the guy with the highest upside in the draft at the quarterback position and that's Caleb Williams uh you go hire the best coordinator available um the dude in it's Waldron in, in Seattle is really good um obviously we've seen that offense have success with a bevy of characters at quarterback and receiver do I have absolute faith right now that the Bears are making the right decisions no but I can't say that really any team can say that. Any fan base can say that about their team. That's true. Um, all right, let's do badass. We were gla- we were glazing Howie Roseman all season, right? Well, he For does have a nicer track thought. record than a lot of the places, a lot of the GMs. Yeah, but what there. I'm saying is like yeah, now, I get what you're saying. They're like blow it up. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. No, I we're all we're all two bad months away from being looking like idiots. Every single person. Yes. Bill Belichick just got fired. Pete Carroll just got fired. Like Nick Saban is no longer coaching Alabama because he got Chris tired. Chris calls of it the Freedom Caucus on Greenlight. It's uh, it's fun. It's fun, and this year we get an exceptional cast of characters for the episode, right? <laughs> exactly right. All right, let's do badasses. Uh, it's if you have the floor on the most badass person you've ever been around in football. Typically, that's a teammate. I do want to talk about some of the pass rushers you went against, but we can put a pin in that for a second. Um, I will say this, and I, I don't know if I ever said this publicly. The reason this segment exists is because I heard a story about a dinner one of your ex teammates was at. And it was a bunch of people who weren't even football people. And one of your ex-teammates was just telling Jay Ratliff stories. That's all he was doing. And the entire tape, the buddy who was telling me was an NBA guy. And he was like, no one knew who Jay Ratliff was. And all they wanted was Jay Ratliff stories. They were just like, we don't know who this guy is, but we're just going to hear Jay Ratliff stories. So that I just wanted to tell you that's the inspiration for this story. You don't have to pick him. Um, obviously, that's a different genre of story. Ooh. But the most badass person you've ever been around in football is who, Kyle Law? Uh, the most badass person early in my career and the best, I'll split What's, it. Yeah, please, two. please. The, the first guy was, uh, we played against the San Francisco 49ers when they were, uh, when it was Kaepernick and the defense was, you know, loaded, uh, loaded, loaded. And my job was to trap, uh, their, their big three technique. And I think you know who I'm talking about. And he had an Anheuser Busch the size, a uh, tattoo the size of a postage stamp, um, on his. I can't remember if it was his left or his right bicep cowboy, who's what I'm yep. talking about. And yep. I'm I'm gonna circle back to the to the end of this story. And this was like you know 23 year old Kyle who was just like 
tell me who to hit and I, they, they're not going to get up. And I trapped him. He didn't look, uh, and I crushed him. And 10 years later, old Kyle Long is playing the, I forget who we were playing. We might've been playing the Niners mm-hmm. at, at Soldier Field and our defensive coordinator was Vic Fangio. And he had a bunch of his guys, former Niners at the game. Cause it was, this was the year 2018. We had the biggest, you know, we had the best defense in the league and it was the sexy game to go to. Gosh, what is his name? Hold on a second. Justin Smith. Second. Yeah. Justin Smith. Yeah. I, was, I keep thinking Justin Thomas, no. Justin Thomas, Justin, Justin Smith. Smith. So Justin, so I'm in the tunnel after the game, we beat the Niners. Um, and I'm walking up the tunnel and I hear, uh, what did he say? He was like, Hey, Pip Squeak or something like that. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, that's a big voice that I heard. So I turned, and it was the largest white man I'd ever seen in that tunnel outside of myself, if I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. And it was Justin Smith. And he was like, I owe you one from 2013. And he remembered the play. He remembered where it was on the field. And I was like, what the hell are you doing? He was like, other than coming back here to whoop your ass, I'm waiting for my old ball coach. And I was like, Vic Fangio. (laughs) For a second there, I was convinced that Justin Smith had, you know, just been waiting, just been waiting. Old Cowboy was waiting for me. And he couldn't <laughs> have been nicer, but he was super badass. Uh, and then and Dominican Sue. Oh, my God. You know, when I took my visit to the Bears, Aaron Cromer and Pat Myers, the two O-line coaches I was telling you about, they brought me in this room and, and they're like, you know why you're here? And I was like, uh, uh, you know, I'm just get to know you guys, uh, you know. And they were like, shut that door. <laughs> they shut the door behind him. We sat down. I sat at the side of a desk. Cromer sat here. Meyer sat on that side, turned around looking at the TV. So we were all like cramped into a little coach's office and you've been in these offices. They're mm-hmm. little. Mm-hmm. And it's, and then they, they put on an Adamican Sioux, what essentially turned out to be a sack tape, but it, it was just like a Adamican Sioux porno tape against the Chicago bears from the last, however long yeah. it was Jay Cutler getting massacred. It was our lineman getting ragged all yeah. after the play, him just bullying our guys and playing good football. Right. And he was like, we brought you here because we need somebody to try to stop him. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and the <laughs> things got more serious. It wasn't like I'm taking a visit to Chicago. Right. It was like, holy <laughs> I, I, I'm used. I'm going to be used as a weapon and means of war uh, here soon with this staff. And they drafted me. And it was like the sand in the hourglass from the minute I got drafted was taking away leading – to the Indomitian Sioux game. And I didn't know, I, I didn't know how to prepare for it mentally. And that week he was like, uh, in the news, he's like, I can't wait to play golden boy. I was having a really good first week, six or seven weeks. And he knew that. And he knew that I knew that. And he made a point to say it in the news. And it really got to me. And when we played him, he didn't look at me. He didn't say anything. And he got a sack on me in Detroit late in the game. Uh, he got me outside. I pushed him by. Cutler was getting flushed right. He got the sack. The place went crazy. And my like everything flashed back to that office. And I was like, I'm not doing my job <laughs> today, am I? And we got a chance to go back and play him in Chicago. And, you know, I had some help from the center at times and the tackle and maybe the fullback and maybe the running back. But I like to think that. I got him back a little bit in our second game at Chicago, although I think we lost. Uh, but he was – he kept me up at night. I will admit it. I could not imagine the pressure of just – you brought in to stop one guy. Um, all right, last thing for you. It's called one rep back. I mean, may, hell, maybe it was Justin Smith or, or Indominus Sue, but you get to relive one – you're, you're – everybody's healthy. You're 28 years old, whatever it is. You're in peak physical condition. You get to go back, relive one rep of your life to get to do it over. What are you picking? I would pick the play, the whatever it was, the third down that led to the double doink. Oh, God. Because I think that Cody Parkey gets a terrible rap. Um, and I think, you know, not only for trying to win that football game, like whatever the third down was, and I, now I'm going to go find it on True Media. I'm going to go find what happened yeah. in the play before the double doink. 
but make a better block or uh, demand a run play behind me and make the block. Uh, because, you know, Cody Parkey, I haven't talked to him. You know what I mean? That guy had a rough go at it, and he's uh, that play is infamous, uh, double doink. And I wish it didn't happen to us. And, you know, Chris got to celebrate on the field with all his teammates. and It was a real bad deal. Uh, family pictures. It was I was faking the smile after that one. Wait, you had to take a f- family photo after the double doink? We played the Eagles. Yeah, no, I all know. My, they still we, made you do it? It's not going to be like, boys, don't take a picture. You know the mom's got to be like, Howie, Chris, Kyle, get in there. Like, boom. <laughs> you had eight months after that to take family photos. It was like the, one of the worst moments of your life. You know what? It's not like family photos, but it's like, hey, let's no, get I a know. pick. I know. I know. I'm in a I'm in a Rambo I'm in a Rambo shirt where he got arrested to his mugshot. Like I thought I was like, I'm gonna out Philly yeah. Philly. So I'm gonna go different universe Rambo yeah. instead of Rocky. Oh wow. It didn't work. So are you absolved? We're all we're trying to say here is that Cody Parkey is innocent of all charges. Really, that's it. The ball was tipped and the offense didn't get down there, and we had plenty of opportunities to score. Um. Yeah. Okay. All right. I feel terrible for Cody. Yeah. No. I. It's. I agree. I agree. It's shorthand. Uh. For for a lot of the Bears' failures over the past couple of decades. Kyle Long, CBS Sports Greenline Pod. Thank you so much for coming on, buddy. You're the man. Thanks so much for having me. Uh. Got to get you on Greenline soon again. Absolutely. Appreciate you, man. All right, guys. Thanks. That was so great. Thanks, man. Mm-hmm.